previously on The Flying Historian. Why are you revisiting this topic? Who are you? Is it because you have come to correct yourself and finally admit that the P-47 is in fact the best plane of World War II? What ifs are different from historical reality and lack important historical context. Instead, they often reduce complex historical realities to a black and white picture, which can easily fit a created narrative. Using what if facts can be misleading. More aces flew in P-51s than P-47s in Europe, but looking at data surrounding number of aces flying either plane in Europe shows a common pattern many historians agree upon, which is that both aircraft contributed equally to the war efforts in the European theater. Both planes were around post-World War II. However, this doesn't prove much of anything. Just because a plane exists after more advanced planes are introduced does not mean that it is timeless. Example, the F-4 Phantom, still in active service with several nations. Meanwhile, these guys also patrol the skies. The P-51 was about $30,000 cheaper than the P-47. However, the gas-guzzling, more expensive P-47 saw more production models built than not only the P-51, but any other American fighter aircraft. Furthermore, the expensive P-47 was used more often than the cheaper P-51 Mustang. This is most likely due to its excellent performance at ground attack, along with its abilities to fight in the air. Technically, more P-47s were lost in combat than P-51s, but this might be because of the very dangerous undertaking of ground operations in all theaters, the European theater being most famous. The P-47's sheer girth protected pilots who were shot down more often than the P-51. So, even though more P-47s were lost physically, pilots were more likely to survive. The P-51 was less likely to survive many attacks, let alone ground fire, but I don't think anybody's arguing that the P-47 isn't a very difficult plane to kill. Quotes are quotes and can be challenging. Here are some actual German quotes. Most other quotes from famous individuals on this topic are often flashy and dramatic rather than factual. And when it comes to quotes from pilots talking about their planes, eh, every fighter pilot, with few exceptions, is going to say their fighter was the best. The idea that there were better pilots in Germany prior to the arrival of the P-51 and that they all disappeared due to the Thunderbolt is a logically brain-breaking theory. The argument's purpose is to present the Thunderbolt as an aircraft which not just had a more difficult task ahead of it, but managed to complete that task prior to the arrival of the P-51. It also is made to make the P-51 seem not as impressive as the hard job was already over. The impressive feats of the P-51 under what I will call the easy environment theory are explained away by stating that untrained pilots flying inferior aircraft are not something that should be considered impressive. The multifaceted madness of this idea stretch far in many directions. They include, but are not limited to, accepting that the Thunderbolt was both inferior to German aviation during their introduction but also somehow not inferior enough to shoot down all of the German aces flying said planes. The idea that there were fewer German aces when the P-51B arrived in Europe due to the Thunderbolt, but that the Thunderbolt having destroyed less fighters would mean that they must have killed a bunch of aces when planes shooting other planes down was at its lowest in the war, and that after doing this incredible job, the P-47 just ran out of steam, I guess? and couldn't pull ahead of the P-51 and kill, by the argument's thesis, the easy guys. It ignores historical facts, creates a narrative to fit the idea, and fails to actually use any historical evidence to back up its claims. Well, I still don't believe you. I'm very tired and still kind of confused about how you got into my house. Or we could just fight right now for dominance. Like real men. Yeah, okay. No, no, please, no! Peace and quiet, finally. I don't know how those guys got into my house.
goodness, that took forever, too. Well, at least I can rest a bit. We can have a nice, relaxing course on the history of the P-51B and the P-47, focusing on the evolving strategy in the air prior to the June landings, the tactics used by American 8th Fighter and Bomber Commands in preparation for a successful operation breaching the German coastal line, and the fight to gain air superiority over Western mainland Europe. We left off toward the end of 1943, right when American Bomber Command realized that, without air cover for their bombers, the first half of their plan to crush German air opposition in the West would be quite costly. We will be discussing that in more detail, as it very much pertains to the history of both planes and their uses. Will we be discussing how London is only 579 miles away from Berlin? How those professionals have lied to us, stating that the P-51 is the only airplane to be able to travel such distances? What about the P-47N? You didn't even give it a mention in the last two videos. Oh no, not again. Um, who are these people? Just ignore them, please. Psst, I've got the goods here. Sweet historical facts the man doesn't want you to know about. Did you guys know that the P-51 was just good in the role it was given? In any other role, it would have been garbage. Not so good of a plane now, right? Isn't your mind blown? I wrote a book about it, too. Hey, no hands on the merchandise. You have to pay for this knowledge. History isn't free, you know. Is that true? I turned my back for two seconds. Don't listen to that halfwit. I read books. I read books too, damn it. The P-51BC was the true American fighter of the war. The workhorse. Powerhouse of the cell. No other comes close to its impact. The P-47 is the best plane. No one has shown otherwise. Greg has done proved it. Who's Greg? Better question, who's the flying historian? Okay, that's enough. This is my classroom, and I will not have you disturb my lecture. Now you can sit down and listen, maybe even learn a thing or two, or, yuck, boring, then you may leave my class. How did- My great-great-granddaddy was a wizard. I'm sure he was. The P-47's top speed was number, 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 at very high feet, and was yes percent faster in unspecified dive than the weak little Mustang and its mark mm -hmm engine. Number, 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 many guns, number, number, P-51 bad, weak. DISGUSTING! Yeah, the way where you present statistics for military aircraft in easily accessible books and media really needs to shift away from giving random numbers. It is not making anyone's job easier. Let's get some basic misconceptions out of the way first. Some pilots who flew the P-47, the first two being from the 56 fighter group, claimed to have broken the sound barrier in steep dives. On the 1st of December 1942, an article in the Republic Aviation News claimed that a P-47 had reached 725 miles per hour. All of these claims are laughably false. The 1942 article released by Republic is believed to be the source of all of these claims. For the most part, any such claim was quickly proven to be an instrument malfunction. Furthermore, the plane's design could only handle 600 miles per hour, not 725, and certainly not 800, which was the highest claim I found. Tests on pre-production P-47Bs in March 1942 found that they had a top speed of 429 miles per hour at 28,000 feet, a range of 350 miles at 25,000 feet, or 835 miles at less than 10,000 feet. Jumping ahead a bit, we land on the P-47D-23. It had an R-2859 engine, rated at 2,000 to 2,300 horsepower in war emergency power setting. It had a top speed of 426 miles per hour at 30,000 feet, a service ceiling of 40,000 feet, and a range of 800 miles at or below 10,000 feet. Later models, like the P-47D-40, carried an R-2859 engine rated at 2,000 to 2,430 horsepower 
when in war emergency power settings. At a top speed of 426 miles per hour at 30,000 feet, a service ceiling of 42,000 feet, and a range of 1,030 miles at or below 10,000 feet with external tanks. Test flights for the YP-47Ms resulted in a top speed of 473 miles per hour at 32,000 feet. The goal of the model was to maximize performance using the same airframe. This was achieved through the use of the R2857 engine, which produced 2,800 horsepower. The P-47M was reported to be able to achieve speeds exceeding 450 miles per hour. The P-51 has a long and interesting story as well. The Mustang 1 had an Allison V-1710-39 single-stage, single-speed supercharger engine, rated at 1,220 horsepower at 10,500 feet. It had a top speed of 385 miles per hour at 14,000 feet. Its supercharger would limit its service ceiling to just below 30,000 feet. Its armament varied. The Mustang 1, used by the RAF, carried eight machine guns, one 50 caliber and two 30 calibers in each wing and two 50 calibers in the nose. I think it looks a bit silly, but that's just me. The USAAF Mustang 1A, or P-51, carried four 20 millimeter cannons, two in each wing. The P-51A would be an appropriate incremental improvement upon the Mustang 1 and 1A. It used the Allison V-1710-81 single-stage, single-speed supercharger engine rated at 1,330 horsepower. The supercharger would be switched with a newer one, though it was still single-staged and speed. It had a top speed of 409 miles per hour, finally breaking the 400 mark. At 20,000 feet, it had a top speed of 382 miles per hour. A new Curtis electric prop would improve the rate of climb to 3,800 feet per minute. The combination of a new prop and a new supercharger would increase the service ceiling to 34,000 feet. The armament also changed to four 50 caliber machine guns, two in each wing. The next step in the Mustang's life would change it forever. The Merlin 61 engine would turn it into a fearsome hunter over the skies of Europe and Japan. The Packard-built Rolls-Royce Merlin V-1653 and later 7 two-stage supercharger engine would be fitted into the aircraft. It was rated at 1,600 horsepower. Performance started to increase rapidly above 20,000 feet. Peak performance was found to be at 25 to 35,000 feet. The aircraft was capable of achieving speeds of 400 miles per hour from 11 to 40,000 feet. At 40,000 feet in level flight, the aircraft indicated 210 miles per hour. Its top speed was around 430 to 440 miles per hour. It could achieve speeds of 430 miles per hour at 25,000 feet. A huge leap in service ceiling was made to 42,000 feet. With two 75-gallon drop tanks, the P-51BC could fly a thousand miles, and if all was done right, flight plan followed to the T, and all that, two 75-gallon tanks could help the P-51BC fly 1,830 miles. Armament remained the same from the P-51A. This all culminated into the D variant, which used a V-1757 engine, rated at 1,720 horsepower. A bubble top canopy finally fixed the visibility issue. No more was there a need for the Malcolm Hood. Two extra 50 caliber machine guns were added into the wings, increasing its stopping power. The guns were also mounted vertically instead of at an angle, which solved the jam problem that plagued the BC variant. The gun sight was changed a few times before ending with the lead computing K-14 gyro gun sight. The wings were strengthened to carry heavier bomb and fuel loads. Speed increased to 440 miles per hour, consistent at 25,000 feet. Pilots claimed to easily be able to fly at 450 miles per hour and above, especially when in a dive. The P-47 was a better dogfighter, though. The Mustang was fast and could turn tight. Are you guys working together now? When British officials first saw the Thunderbolt, they believed the American plane would be slaughtered. Due to inexperienced pilots, P-47s did not fare well at the start. 
It wasn't until late summer of 1943 when the 8th Air Force started to see major success. Early reports on P-47C's climb and maneuverability found that it was lacking in both, but pilots were quickly learning how to use its strengths. The P-47 could outdive the BF-109 and FW-190. Below 15,000 feet, the P-47 was slow and not very maneuverable. German pilots would lure P-47s down low, but this would become a mistake later, as P-47 pilots learned to take advantage of this by outdiving them, catching up to them, and then shooting them down. The P-47C and early Ds were slightly underpowered and could not outclimb mainstay German fighters. In early 1944, water injection and paddle blade props reduced this bug. Turning combat was just not recommended for the P-47C variant at any altitude. Its speed advantage was to be used as much as possible. Reports found that the early P-47s had the same issues in the Pacific as they did in Europe. Later war P-47s were far superior to other late war Axis fighters so long as they were not low and slow, where enemy planes typically outpaced them. The Mustang One's shortcomings above 15,000 feet made the British move it over to the ground attack role. They had come to accept that the Spitfire and Hurricane would take up air-to-air -air combat. As stated before, the P-51BC was a massive improvement from the P-51A. The P-51BC was great at low as well as high altitudes. Its combat record in Europe alone stands as a testament to its strengths over its adversaries. Just like the Jugs, Mustangs followed the speed power strategy, or boom and zoom. To wrap this up in a nice bow, at 25,000 feet, the P-51D was 35 miles per hour faster than the ME-109G, 50 miles per hour faster than the FW-190, and 90 miles per hour faster than the Zero. The FW-190A and ME-109G had slightly greater rates of climb, though the P-51D was much faster in a climb than the Zero was. The D variant could outdive any access plane. It could turn tighter than the ME-109, was equal with the FW-190, and, well, the Zero is sort of in a whole different ballpark. But the Mustang got more kills than the Thunderbolt, right? The P-47 achieved over 7,000 enemy aircraft destroyed, with over half of that destroyed in the air. The P-47 in the Mediterranean was responsible for more ships sunk than any other Allied aircraft. I couldn't find much in terms of their work in the Pacific, but I know that they were used as effective ground support platforms, so I assume they did well there too. Starting in April 1943 through till mid-1943, P-51A, Recon F-6A Mustangs, plus A-36A dive bombers arrived in North Africa. The A-36 would use straight-on dive attacks with their weird 90-degree angle dive flaps. I mean, look at these things. The death-defying stunt would garner the aircraft the nickname from the Germans, who could not hit them, Screaming Devils. They would bomb German and Italian positions from North Africa up into Italy and then Greater Europe. During the invasion of Sicily, over 2,775 bombs struck enemy targets over the course of 1,971 sorties. The list of materials destroyed is very impressive for such a small number of planes. By the end of the A-36A's service, pilots had flown 23,375 sorties, dropping 8,000 tons of ordnance, shot down 84 enemy aircraft, and lost 177 to ground fire and air-to-air -air combat. It was the American Super Stuka. In its first 55 days of combat, the P-51BC shot down 13.1 enemy aircraft per 100 sorties. This is much higher than the P-38 at 4.3, and much, much higher than the P-47 at 2.7. In early 1944, P-51s were just 10% of escort fighters, but got 30% of the kills. From January till April 1944, Germany lost anywhere from 10 to 40% of fighters sent on any given intercept mission. Even with only 250 Mustangs in 1944, 
in the China Burma India Theater, American P 51BC pilots are credited with killing the vast majority of the irreplaceable skilled Japanese pilots of the theater. P 51s shot down 130 German jet and rocket powered aircraft, 118.5 ME 262s, 12 Arado AR 234s, and 5. ME 163s. The P 47 is credited with 20 and a half, and the P 38 has no such credits. In the European theater alone, the Mustang shot down 4,950 enemy aircraft and destroyed another 4,131 of them on the ground. That is more aircraft than any other American fighter can claim in the European theater. The P 51 filled a gap that needed filling. It wasn't any good. It was just good in that gap. The most honest thing I have ever heard. Do you know him? What are his qualifications? When your baby granddaughter or maybe baby daughter plays doctor with you, do you then go to your actual doctor and ask about her diagnosis? The comment is correct, is it not? I'm gonna run out of hair before the video is through. The P-51 was originally designed to fit the requirements set by the British for a surplus fighter plane, which go along with or replace the aging P-40s already in use by the RAF. The resulting aircraft was made in record time and quickly entered British service as the Mustang Mark I. The P-51A had many shortcomings, which resulted primarily from its weak Allison engine. This relegated the P-51A to ground attack operations and observation or reconnaissance duty. When the P-51A and A-36 Apache, or Invaders, entered service with the USAAF in 1943, the role it fit best in was not changed. It remained primarily a ground attack and recon aircraft. The newer model P-51B-Cs were fitted with the Packard-built Merlin engine, significantly improving the plane's overall capabilities. The old, much weaker Allison engine was a far cry from the more powerful Merlin engine. Its initial design of being a fighter who could carry bombs and external fuel would help it in the long run, but the presence of a new engine proved that the P-51 could be a dogfighter. Initial test runs with the new engine surprised British observers who would go on to purchase P-51BCs, and the USAAF would follow suit. Around the same time the P-51BC entered service with the USAAF in Europe, American bomber and fighter commands were looking for an aircraft that was capable of escorting bombers deep into Germany, where aviation factories lay. Beyond just escort, German fighters had been set well behind their own lines, so the 8th needed an escort fighter which could take on the Luftwaffe and destroy them. The P-51 would finally get to prove itself to be a worthy fighter plane. If history isn't enough, then we can go bare bones and look at how the military and manufacturers described their own aircraft. Within the pilot's manual for the P-51D Mustang, the aircraft is described specifically as a fighter plane. The P-51 was clearly a fighter, but it didn't start off that way. The glow-up was real. Though, even in roles which it was modified to complete, it still did decently well. As an interesting tidbit, the US Navy during 1945 started to test if the P-51 could be a valuable addition to their air arsenal. Tests on the decks of American carriers were conducted, but ultimately the Navy already had plenty of qualified aircraft which fit the role of air superiority fighter. The expectation of the P-47 was to have a heavily armed fighter capable of intercepting and destroying bombers, provide cover for high-flying bombers, and be able to offensively interact with enemy interceptors. For the most part, the designers of the P-47 knocked it out of the park. They managed to achieve what many thought wouldn't be possible, a heavily armed and armored plane that was also maneuverable and very fast. The pilot's manual for the P-47C and D describes the aircraft as a powerful fighter plane. The P-47N's description changes from powerful fighter to long-range fighter bomber. The significance here is mostly just an observation of time past. By the time the P-47N, and therefore its manuals, rolled out of the production line, the P-47, in its role of fighter bomber, had become very well known. 
In the Pacific Theater, the P-47C would start off as an escort fighter for bombers. It would begin ground attack operations roughly around the same time in 1943 as their European counterparts. As the island hopping campaigns lengthened the distance between safe harbor and enemy territory, the P-47 was dropped for the longer-ranged twin-engine P-38 Lightnings, who did not have as many problems in the Pacific as they did in Europe. The P-47 would see a return to the Pacific Theater toward the end of the war, but it played in the part that it had become famous in, fighter bomber. It is important to note that the P-47 also saw physical changes to match the role which the military saw the aircraft fit best in. Just like how the A-36 received diving flaps to help it be a better ground attacker, the most produced variant of the P-47D, the P-47D-30, with 2,600 produced, added diving flaps under the wings. This would help the pilot in controlled dives. This was partly because the aircraft was best when in a dive, but also because, by this point, it had begun to be used extensively as an attacker. Following the introduction of P-51s, the P-47 switched to a more ground attack and harass role, fighter sweeps and more. We will talk about why later. A fun factoid for the P-47 is that American Bomber Command in Europe early during the war tried to have the P-47 be a high-altitude bomber. Before moving on, I'd like to say, stating that a plane is only good within the role that it was given is a weird way of attacking it. If you are attacking the basis of its design not matching how it was used, that's one thing. All you are saying here is that the P-51, designed as a fighter plane, was only good at being a fighter plane. Um, thank you? Again, nobody is arguing that the P-51 is a fantastic ground attack aircraft, or that the P-47 wasn't impressive for being proficient in more than one role. I mean, heck, that's why either of these planes are famous. This argument is targeting a straw man. Hello! This is the flying historian of the present speaking. I know this is leaving off on quite the cliffhanger, right before we dive into the history of the usage of both aircraft and try and answer this big question we've been looking at this whole time, but I felt as though it has been long enough since I've released something, and this video is taking particularly long to prepare for y'all. That being said, part three, I guess, is in the works and is nearing completion, so expect that in the near future. I also have some really exciting new video ideas that I will also be releasing soon. One, before part three is released. I want to get it out on July 4th if I can. Why did this video take so long to release, I hear from none of you? Well, I got a job. Days after releasing part one of this series, and it's something that I'm very passionate about. That quickly ate up all of my time and I had to shift focus. Now that I have a solid footing once again, I'm more confident that I can create content regularly again. Maybe not as frequently as before, but it's a start. I hope you stick with me because I have some really exciting stuff planned. Before I close out, I would like to thank staff members of the Boeing Museum of Flight, the Seattle Public Library, and the U.S. Air Force Museum for helping me conduct research for this video. Oh, and I almost forgot. Okay, bye.